So this will be kind of the summary of the SN2 and SN1 reactions. So, so far we have spoken about both types of reactions, but we haven't compared them. So let's compare them. And let's begin by going over each reaction. So in an SN2 reaction, we have the substrate, a nucleophile, undergoing a simple, a single step reaction in which the nucleophile attacks the carbon from the rear side kicking off this leaving group, producing this full new substrate as well as the leaving group. In the SN1 reaction, it's a two-step mechanism. The first step is the ionization step. Our leaving group leaves or detaches from the carbon by itself, stabilized by our solvent, and then the carbocation intermediate bonds with the nucleophile or our solvent to form the final product. So a one-step mechanism versus a two-step mechanism. So let's begin by describing how the substrate size or structure influences each of these two reactions. So in the SN2 reaction, these reactions require that a nucleophile gets to the substrate with ease. And that means the smaller our side groups are, the more likely our SN2 reaction will take place. So our SN2 reaction will be favored for the methyl and primary substrates. Now, for the SN1 reaction, these reactions require that the carbocation intermediate is stabilizing. It's stabilized by the solvent and it's also stabilized by large groups around our uh, carbocation. In other words, if we have carbon groups next to uh, this carbon, that means we're going to develop hyperconjugation. Hyperconjugation is the stabilization of the side groups and this 2p empty orbital. So, the larger these groups are, the more likely that an SN1 reaction will take place. So, SN1 reaction will be favored for the tertiary and the secondary intermediate carbocation. So, once again, if we go from methyl to our tertiary, we see that as we go across this way, our SN1 reaction rates increase. As we go backward, our SN2 reactions increase. In other words, our SN2 reactions are more likely to occur going this way than going the other way. Now let's describe how the solvent influences our SN1 and SN2 reactions. So generally speaking, and this is not always true, but generally speaking, polar solvents will favor SN1 reactions by stabilizing the carbocation intermediate. Now polar solvents will also stabilize SN2 reactions. Why? Because when we look at our partial uh, or when we look at our transition state, the transition state will have partial charges. And those partial charges will be stabilized by our polar solvents. But because our SN1 reaction actually develops products, intermediates, that have full charges, our polar solvents will stabilize our SN1 reaction more than SN2 reactions. Now, however, things are not so simple for secondary substrates. Why? Well, because earlier I said that SN2 reactions are favored for our primary and methyl uh, uh, substrates, while at the same time, SN1 reactions are favored for tertiary uh, compounds, for tertiary substrates. When we get to our secondary group, we can have both our SN1 reaction and SN2 reactions occurring. So we have to be careful because things are not so simple for secondary substrates. The polar solvent approaches from the rear. So suppose we have the following substrate. Suppose we have a secondary substrate. Now suppose that we have a polar solvent such as a water molecule. So let's suppose our SN1 reaction begins to take place, our first step begins to take place, and our leaving group begins to leave. So as our leaving group begins to leave, this leaving group develops a partial negative charge, and this develops a partial positive charge. 
Now, as this group is leaving, our polar water molecule will approach this side. Why this side? Well, because this side is sterically hindered by this leaving group. Now, when this guy approaches, when this water molecule approaches, it can do one of two things. It can either stabilize this charge, this partial positive charge, with this partial negative charge on this oxygen, or it can use this pair of electrons to attack this carbon via an SN2 reaction. So, anytime we're looking at a secondary structure, at a secondary substrate, we have to take into consideration the solvent type, the nucleophile, and the leaving group. We have to take everything into consideration, weigh our uh, choices, and see which one of the reactions will be more likely to take place. But once again, generally speaking, a polar solvent will stabilize SN1 reactions more than SN2 reactions. But for secondary substrates, we really have to look at the nucleophile and leaving group. So let's look at that right now. In SN2 reactions, remember, we need a strong nucleophile. Why? Because in our SN2 reaction, we have a one-step mechanism in which this pair of electrons attacks the carbon displacing, kicking off this leaving group. So, we need to have a good strong nucleophile as well as a good leaving group. So, SN2, strong nucleophile, and good leaving group. Now, on the other hand, in SN1 reactions, the first step is the rate determining step, the ionization step, in which our leaving group needs to detach. So that means we really need to have a good leaving group for SN1 reactions. And the nucleophile doesn't matter as much because this is the structure or product determining step. This nucleophile does not influence the rate, it influences what the structure of the product will be. So, for our SN1 reactions, weak nucleophiles and good leaving groups are favored. Now, let's compare the rate law and stereochemistry or mechanism of our reaction. So, for SN2 reactions, SN2 reactions, the 2 stands for a bimolecular reaction. That means in our rate law, we're going to see the concentration of substrate multiplied by the concentration of nucleophile multiplied by the constant of the forward reaction. Let's say it's K1. So the rate in an SN2 reaction depends on both the concentration of substrate as well as the concentration of our nucleophile. So increasing either of these two concentrations will increase the rate of our reaction. Now in our SN2 reaction, as we said earlier, this is a single step in which the transition state is a planar and is sp2 hybridized. So as this bond is formed, this bond is broken, and the transition state these three bonds are sp2 hybridized and carbon is also sp2 hybridized. So these groups flip as an umbrella would flip in the wind. Now, let's look at the SN1 reaction. Here we have different things going on. Now we have two different steps. The first step is the ionization step. It's the rate determining step. The second step is the product determining step. It's the quick step. So the slow step and the quick step. Now, our rate law, because this is the slow step, this is our rate determining step. And that means because only the substrate appears in our reactant side, that means our rate law strictly depends on only our concentration of substrate. It does not depend on concentration of nucleophile. So we take another constant, K2, the constant for this reaction going in a forward direction, multiplied by the concentration of substrate. So if we increase the concentration of substrate, we increase the rate of reaction. But if we increase the concentration of nucleophile, that will not change the rate of our reaction. So once again, this is a two-step mechanism in which the intermediate is formed, and the intermediate is a carbocation. So we 
have no intermediates here. We go from our reactant straight to the final product, but in the SN1, we begin with reacting the substrate, go to an intermediate, and the intermediate then reacts with the nucleophile to form our product. So our nucleophile in this case, in this case, acts to determine the final structure of our products. Okay, so what can we conclude about this comparison? Well, our conclusion is the following. SN1 and SN2 reactions complement one another in the sense that where one succeeds, the other one fails. So, looking at the substrate size and structure, our SN2 reactions are favored or succeed when we're dealing with methyl or primary substrate structure. When we're looking at our tertiary structure, SN2 reactions fail, but SN1 reactions succeed because we have a stabilized carbocation intermediate. Now, for secondary structures, things get complicated. Whenever we're dealing with secondary, we also have to consider solvent type, nucleophile, and leaving group, where solvent will generally stabilize SN1 reactions more than SN2 reactions, and strong nucleophiles, good leaving groups, favor our SN2 reaction, while poor nucleophiles and good leaving groups favor our SN1 reaction.